All right, this one may take a little bit longer because I'm going to spend a little bit of time walking um, you guys through all these problems since they're your first ones about buoyancy, just to make sure you have understanding of what's going on. Um, first one, uh, to mention, we have a wood block um, that has a density of... So I'll, right away, I noticed that there are a lot of different units in this problem. And I would just remind everyone that the units we really want to work with are our metric system units. We want to use... For mass, we want to work with kilograms. For distances, we want to work with meters. And right away I see I have grams and centimeters. So my first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna switch all my units to the ones that I really need. And also for density, we want to work with kilograms per cubic meter. So I see um, the wood has a density of 0.6 grams per cubic centimeter. Uh, I'm not going to go through, you can look, worry about conversions a little bit later, but to convert from grams a cubic centimeter to kilograms a cubic meter, you, do, you multiply by 1,000. So this is going to be 600 kilograms per cubic meter. Now I got some centimeters here. I got 8 centimeters, 8 centimeters, and 4 centimeters for the dimensions of the block. So this is really going to be 0 0.08 meters and 0 0.08 meters and 0 0.04 meters to get those, to convert all those to meters. Remember, centimeters to meters, you divide by 100. So they're released into a tank of water, and it gives me actually both versions. So I wanna make sure I use the kilogram per cubic meter version of the density of water if I need it. So question A says, will it, or yeah, question A says, will it float or sink? Now I know that the, because the density of the wood is less than the density of the water, I know it's gonna float. That's one of the things we learned um, we were going through this and we did your little experiments. So that's all you need to justify is it's gonna float because the density of the wood is less than the density of water. That's all you'll need for a justification. Part B, what's the weight of this block of wood? Now, usually we would use the fact that the weight is M times G, mass times the gravity field constant, but we don't have a mass. So we gotta think, okay, well, how else can I get the mass? That's another little trick that we learned that we can write mass in terms of something's density and its volume. And if we use that version, we can say the weight is going to be equal to the density of the wood times the volume of the wood times the gravity field constant. So density of the wood's given, that's 600 kilograms per cubic meter. Now the volume we have to find, it's a cube, or a it's not technically a cube, rectangular prism. So it's gonna be length times width times height. So this is gonna be 0.08 times 0 0.08 times 0 0.04 for the dimensions of the block. And then we're gonna times it by G and I'm gonna be lazy. I'm gonna use G equals 10 Newtons per kilogram instead of 9.8, because why not? Makes life a little bit easier for us when we're just doing problems. Again, in real life, you're doing your lab, you wanna make sure you use the, the more precise version of gravity. But for our case, let's just use 10. And we multiply that out and we get that the weight of this thing is going to be, now it looks like it might be big because I got a big number there and a 10, but these are all really tiny numbers and it ends up being about 1.54 Newtons for the weight. And if I think back to my high school days, our nerdy days, we would always box our answers because my teacher wanted me to, I don't, I'm not gonna force you, but it does help you because it helps you when you're done and you have a lot of stuff on the page, you can see where your answers are. All right, uh, part C, what's the buoyant force acting on the wood uh, due to the water? Well, we could try to figure this out. We could, uh, we don't know how much is underwater yet, so we can't figure it out that way by definition of buoyancy, but it's floating. So if I draw a free by diagram, here's my block. I have a buoyant force acting up. I have a gravity force going down. And if I do my Newton's law equation, buoyant force minus gravity force equals M times A. Well, if it's floating, that means the acceleration is zero. It has no acceleration. So the buoyant force must be equal to the gravity force. And guess what? I just found the gravity force. So the buoyant force is exactly the same in this case. Remember, this is only true when things are floating. If they're not floating. You have to find it a different way. But in this case, that's true. Uh, let's see now. Let's move on. If the wood floats, which we just figured out that it does float, um, how much the wood block would be above the water? Now here, again, I, I underlined it because 
So I'm a little bit being a little bit sneaky, and we'll see in a second why. So again, we can go back. We already have a free by but diagram drawn. So we can say again, the buoyant force equals the gravity force. And our other definition of buoyant force, let's write this over on the side. This is always true. It's going to be the density of the liquid, or actually density of the fluid, but we're in a liquid now, times the volume underwater times G. That's always going to be true. So we can say that this is equal to density of the liquid times the volume underwater times G. Uh, we know how big it is. So we can just put some numbers in. So let's see, the density of our liquid is 1,000. The volume underwater is what we're looking for. G is 10, and that's going to equal 1.54 newtons. So the volume underwater is going to be equal to, do a little bit of math, and uh, you get, so let's see, Actually, you know what? Um, you could do it this way. Well, sorry, I'll, we'll figure it out this way. I'll show you a second, another way to do it. So 1.54 divided by 10,000. And you get 1.54 times 10 to the negative four uh, cubic meters. Now that's not our answer. That's how much is underwater. We want how much is above water. So I could say the volume above is going to be the total volume, call it V naught, minus the volume underwater. Um, the total volume, we did, I never wrote it down, but it's 0.08 times 0.08 times 0.04. So I got uh, 2.56 times 10 to the negative 4 minus our 1.54 times 10 to the negative 4. And that gives me... Um, about 1.02 times 10 to the negative four cubic meters that is above the water. So that's one way we could solve this. That's a perfectly fine way. Now I'll show you a little trick. Instead of using over here, instead of using the volume under the water in terms of um, actual the actual volume, I'm gonna write it in terms of a percentage. So I'm gonna write this equation a little bit differently. And before I put numbers in, you'll see there's a little something nice, uh, nice I can do. So I'm gonna start here and I'm gonna say the buoyant force is density of the liquid times the volume underwater times G and that's equal to, now I'm gonna write the weight, the gravity force in this, just like I did up above. Um, so it's gonna be the density of the block or the wood, I guess I called it W before, times the volume of the wood times G. So that's just rewriting this equation right here a different way. Now, notice what happens, the G's go away. If I solve for the volume underwater, that is gonna be equal to the density of the wood divided by the density of the liquid times the volume of the wood, which is the total volume of the wood, now, if I want this as a percentage, I can say, well, the volume of the wood is just 100%, because it's all of it. And if I solve this, I get the volume underwater as a percentage is gonna be 600 over 1,000, which is 60%. So it says how much is underwater. So again, it can, you kind of can interpret this. Do you want the amount, the volume in an amount underwater, or do you want the percentage underwater and above water? So now I have 60%. Well, if 60% is underwater, that means the percentage above water is gonna be 40%. So this answer, the way this question is worded is just as good as that answer. And actually it might even be more useful because if someone says, well, how much is underwater? And you tell them, oh, well, there's a volume of 1.02 times 10 to negative four cubic meters underwater. They're not gonna know what that means, but if you say, or, or that's above water, but if you say, oh, it's 40% above water, any layperson can understand what that means. So there's just two ways of finding the same thing. Again, if they on a test you might be more precise, it might tell you to ask or it might ask you to tell them the volume, or it might ask you to tell them a percentage. But either way is fine for this problem. All right, let's move on. How much weight could be added to the top of the block before it sinks? 
So whenever you see these things here before it sinks, you're looking for like kind of a worst case scenario. So right before it sinks, your buoyant force is maxed out. And when does that happen? Well, that happens when your object is fully submerged. So that's when the volume underwater becomes the same as, well, actually I'm going to say it equals, ends up equaling the volume of your object. So that's a little trick here. Whenever you're these worst case things, if it says like how many people be, can go on before it sinks or how much mass can you go on before it sinks or here, how much weight, it means your the volume underwater becomes the same as the total volume. That's what those words mean. Then once you realize that, it's just really the same problem. So here, I'm going to redraw a free body diagram. We got a buoyant force going up. We got a gravity force going down, and now we have extra gravity. So I'm just going to call it W for this is the weight added going down. Draw free by or draw my equation, write my equation from my free body diagram. Buoyant force minus the weight minus this added force equals zero because it's the worst case, just right before it sinks. So we're going to still assume the acceleration is zero. And now the see the weight hasn't changed. The buoyant force is new. I have to use my the total volume of this thing. And then um, I can solve for the weight. So the added weight is going to be the max buoyant force. I'll put a little max here to remind myself. Minus the weight. This is going to be density of my liquid times the total volume times G. Minus the um, weight of my object. And that's going to be, let's see, density of my liquid is 1,000. Um, let's see, I found the total volume. It's right there. So it's 2.56 times 10 to the negative four times 10 minus, let's see, did I ever find the weight? Yeah, the weight of the thing I think is what, 1.54, is that what it was? Yep, 1.54. And I do a little bit of math and I end up with that the, the added weight is going to be, let's see, 1.024 Newtons. And you might notice, hey, that seems similar. I have, look at that's kind of a similar number up here. That's not always going to be true just because all of my numbers here were multiples of 10 because the density and G were multiples of 10. It's really just the volume times a bunch of 10s, in this case times 10,000. So they look similar, but that's not always going to be true. It's just kind of a, a luck, lucky thing because of the numbers that I picked for this problem. All right, so on to the last one. If the block were instead made out of aluminum, which has a greater density, of 2,700 kilograms per cubic meter, what would its acceleration be as it sunk to the bottom? So this time I can go back to my one of my equations. This is still gonna be true. The uh, net force is gonna be the buoyant force minus the weight of the object. The only difference is now the buoyant force is gonna be the same. It's gonna be maxed out. Um, so it's gonna be the same equation as this except for the weight's gonna be different. So I can just say that it's gonna be a density of liquid times the volume of the object times G minus the density of the aluminum times the volume of the object times G. Uh, we could pop, I mean, if you want to, you could group this differently, but it doesn't really matter. So we're gonna get a thousand times uh, 2.56 times 10 to negative four times 10 minus 2,700 times 2.56 times 10 to negative four times 10. And we do our little bit of math and uh, this is gonna equal, I forgot to write the M times A. This is gonna equal, um, again, I don't know the mass, so I have to do the density deal. Remember mass is really density times volume. So this is gonna be 2,700 times uh, 2.56 times 10 to negative four times A, and now I can just do a little bit of typing, divide both sides by this, and you get an acceleration, if this was aluminum, of about negative 6.3 meters per second squared. Negative because it's gonna go down. Now, um, in real life, this would not accelerate that way. We're, we're basically assuming there's no friction in real life. Um, a, an aluminum thing going through a uh, water is going to have a lot, a lot of resistance going through it. So it'll be very, very different than this. But for our sake, that's like the initial acceleration that it would start going at. So there's the first problem.
Let's jump to the second problem. All right, this one says we got a block of styrofoam. It's hanging from a rigid bar, lowered into a tank of water as shown. Block is a 10, uh, 0.10 meter cube, and it's submerged 60% into the water. So this is a little bit nicer. The units seem a little more reasonable than the last problem. So you don't have to really worry about those. They all seem to be correct. That's in the correct units. That's in correct units. That's in the correct units. Uh, first part, what's the weight of the block? Again, we're just going to go back. Gravity force is density of the object times the volume of the object times G because we know it's density. And um, now it's the volume. It says it's a 0.10 uh, meter cube. That means it has three dimensions of 0.10. So this is going to be, let's see, 80 times 10 length, 10 width, 10 height times 10 for gravity, a lot of 10s. And we get this thing has a weight of zero. Oops, I made a mistake. I forgot my decimal points. I almost made a mistake, but I got them in there. So this ends up being about 0.8 Newtons, which we would expect because it's styrofoam. Styrofoam doesn't weigh very much. Uh, part B, what's the buoyant force acting on the block? Well, the buoyant force, now I can't use the floaty part where, because this is not floating, it's attached to a rod, so I can't use the fact that it's the same as the gravity force like the last problem. So I have to draw a free body diagram, which I should have done in the first place anyways. We got the tension going up. We have the, or I'm gonna write draw it up, not really sure if it's going up or down right now. We have the buoyant force going up and we have the weight going down. So in, the, our, in this case, our buoyant force is gonna be the density of our liquid times the volume underwater times G. So that's gonna be, um, it's water again. So it's a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Now the volume underwater, it says it's 60% underwater and it had a volume of 0.1 by 0.1 by 0.1. So I'm just gonna put this as 60%. So 0.6 of 0.1 by 0.1 by 0.1. So this is the volume right here, just 60% of the total volume times 10 for G, um, like power is a 10. And we get the buoyant force and this object ends up being six Newtons in this situation. Um, draw for our diagram, well, I already did that up there and determine the force that's being applied to the bar in place. Now I can, do the sum of my forces, it's gonna be T plus the buoyant force. And I can already see my T is probably in the wrong direction, but that's right. We'll see if, remember, if you if you draw a free body diagram and you draw something in the wrong direction that you don't know, it'll just come out negative and that's completely fine. It just tells you it's in the other direction. So this is not moving, there's no acceleration. So therefore it's gonna be in equilibrium. So the total force is gonna air the sum of the forces equals zero. Now I can just put in what I know. So I got T plus uh, six Newtons minus 0.8 Newtons equals zero. And I get T in this case equals uh, negative 5.2. And all that means is that T is really 5.2 Newtons opposite the direction I drew it. So it's really 5.2 Newtons pointing down. And again, because this, this uh, styrofoam wants to float really high, you're, you're pushing it down. To, to keep it in this position to be submerged that much, you have to apply a downward force to keep it that deep because it would normally float at a higher level. Um, if the bar were to break, what would happen to the styrofoam block? Well, if the bar breaks, that means the tension goes bye-bye. Tension goes to zero. And since the buoyant force is greater than the gravity force, the block's gonna accelerate in the direction of the buoyant force, so it's going to accelerate up. Um, determine the acceleration of the block if the bar were to break. So now it's just saying to do what we just did. So again, let's redraw our free body diagram really quick. We have our buoyant force and our gravity force and no tension anymore. So some of the forces, buoyant force minus gravity force is gonna equal M times A. Let's see our buoyant force. We figured that out was that, uh, I believe it was six. So we have six Newtons minus our weight, which was 0.8 Newtons. And that's gonna equal, um, now we gotta figure out the mass of this thing. Do we know the mass of this thing? Um, well, if the weight is 0.8, we know the mass is point, or yeah, the weight is 0.8, we know the mass 
is the weight divided by G, so that's going to be 0.8 over 10, which is 0 0.08. So this is going to be 0 0.08 times A. So do a little bit of math. The acceleration ends up being about 65 meters per second per second. All right. On to question three. Um, we got a block of this time it gives you the total weight so be a little bit careful a lot of times they just give you the mass this time they gave you the actual weight um it has its volume has part of its volume submerged in water block is partially supported by a string of a fixed length uh when 80 percent of the block's volume is submerged the tension in the string is five newtons take the density of water to be a thousand what's the magnitude of the buoyant force acting on the block so again i'm gonna check my units newtons are good newtons are good kilograms per cubic meters are good i'm liking all those units so I'm going to first start by drawing my free by diagram. We got the tension, we got the weight going down, and we got a buoyant force. Again, I'm not the greatest at drawing the sizes sometimes, so I doubt the tension is that big, but that's all right. Actually, I should probably draw this a little bigger. Because again, your arrows don't have to be exactly perfect, but you want to try to draw them. If they're bigger than something, try to draw them bigger just so that um, visually it helps you understand what's going on. So what's the magnitude of the buoyant force? So I'm going to take my free by diagram, write a Newton's law equation from it. So sum of the forces equal the buoyant force minus the tension minus the gravity force on it. And they're, it's in equilibrium, so they're all equal to zero. So the buoyant force is going to be, um, let's see, mg. Do the action, let's keep it as a gravity force. Equal to the gravity force uh, plus the tension. No. Why drew the tension up? Yeah, so it's going to be gravity. I'm losing my brain. Buoyant force is going to be, you've got to bring both these to the other side. No, tension should be positive. That's I knew I made a mistake somewhere. Yeah. Drew it up, positive. So it's a point, the gravity force minus the tension. And that's going to be, let's see, the gra gravity force is 45. Newtons, the tension they said in this case was five Newtons. So the buoyant force is gonna be 40 Newtons. Water is steadily removed from the beaker causing the block to become less submerged. String breaks when its tension exceeds 35 Newtons. What percentage of blocks volume is submerged at the moment the string breaks? So here we gotta be a little bit sneaky. Um, so let's use our same equation from before because it's, it's going to be a different spot and then we're going to try to figure out how much is submerged from it because we're, we're going to figure out what the buoyant force is when it snaps. So the buoyant force, I'm, I'm really, I'm using the same exact equation because same situation, it's just a different buoyant force. It's going to be the same weight that hasn't changed, but now we want to find the spot when it snaps. So that's when the tension goes to 35. And so that tells me the buoyant force is going to be 10 newtons now i could go back and try to plug it in and try to figure out the exact volumes but i don't really know that so i'm going to do a trick not really that's not really a trick i'm just going to use my brain a little bit and i know that when it's 80 percent submerged the buoyant force is 40. And i want to figure out what percentage is submerged when the buoyant force is 10. and i know that the buoyant force is proportional to the percent submerged. So let's see, well, if 80% if eighty submerged gives me 40, what percent gives me 10? I'm pretty sure it's gonna be 20% because I want this ratio. So 80 to 40 is the same as something to 10, that something is 20% submerged. So we can say the volume underwater is 20% submerged. Again, I just use this ratio thing. The fact that they're proportional, use some ratios, makes my life a little bit easy. Um, let's see, after the string breaks and the block comes to new equilibrium, equilibrium position in the beaker, what percent of the block's volume is submerged? So again, we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna say now um, the buoyant force, if there's no tension, the buoyant force and it floats is equal to, there you go, the gravity force. Again, I could draw a free ride diagram. We've done that many times. I'm just going to jump right to there. 
which we know is still the same, is going to be 45 newtons. And I'm going to go back and use my exact same situation here. If 80% um, is to 40 newtons as what percent is to 45 newtons, right? Because I know the buoyant force is still proportional to the percent submerged. So I'm going to use those ratios. That ratio is going to be the same for all the different ones. And I do a little bit of math and I'm pretty sure that the percent submerged in this case is going to be 90%. Anyhow, we can check. It should be the buoyant force is a little bit bigger. So the percent submerged should be a little bit bigger and it is. All right, on to number five or four. So this one really isn't a problem. This is just some checkboxy things. I'm going to go through these quick and just kind of talk a little bit about why the answers are the answers. I don't know why that's gray. Um, so here we have um, a situation where we have a beaker on a scale with the object above it hanging. And it, the, we have a bunch of scale readings. You want to figure out what, what they're going to be in these different situations. So part A is the kind of initial spot where the object's hanging and the scale reads 12 newtons. And again, we might think, okay, well, the scale always reads what's up, what's on it. So in case A, just the uh, beaker in the water or, or liquid or whatever is in it is on it. So the scale is reading the weight of the beaker in the water. And the um, tension in the string in part A is holding up the ball all by itself. So the tension in the string should be 20 newtons. Um, figure B, what is the buoyant force in the ball? So the tension dropped by 10, right? tension goes down by 10, well, how, why would it go down by 10? Only if something started helping it, and guess what? That thing help, helping it's the buoyant force. So the tension does 10 less newtons of force, and means the buoyant, the buoyant force had to do 10 more newtons of force. So the buoyant force is going to be 10. Or C, in figure B, what's the scale reading? Well, let's see. Um, I'm going to assume it's half underwater because it looks like it's half underwater. They didn't really say it. Or it does say it's half, exactly half submerged, so... That was a good assumption. So if it's half submerged, and I know the maximum buoyant force here is 10 Newtons, and that's what it maxes out when it's fully submerged. If it's half submerged, the buoyant force is gonna be five Newtons. So it's gonna be half of that. And so if I um, figure out what this is gonna read, It's going to be reading, I believe, the original 12, because the liquid is still there. So it's going to read the original 12 plus the buoyant force that it's met, that's um, being applied over here. So it's going to read 17. And figure C. Oh, wait, you know what? I just made a mistake. Um. That's the answer to F. I should read my problems better. Sorry about that. That's the answer to F because this says it's, I was looking at figure C. Part C said figure B. So let's go back to figure B. What's the scale reading in figure B? Well, that's going to be the um, original reading on the scale, which was 12 newtons plus the added buoyant force. Because remember, if the water is pushing up on the, on the, uh, the ball here, the ball is pushing down, the scale is going to feel that downward push. So it's going to do the 12 plus the extra 10, and that's going to be 22. All right, part D. Um, in figure C, what's the buoyant force in the ball? Um, we already I did that when I did the wrong problem before. So the buoyant force in the ball there, for the reason I explained before, is going to be 5. Part E. Um, in figure C, what's the tension in the string? Well, the tension was originally 20, and the buoyant force is helping out 5, so the tension is going to be... The original 20 minus to 5, the buoyant force is helping, so that is going to be 15 newtons. Uh, we did F, part G. In figure D, what's the buoyant force in the ball? So it's so again, it's fully submerged. Even though it's touching the bottom, remember, the buoyant force only depends on the density, the volume underwater, and G. Well, guess what? This is exactly the same situation as B. They're both fully submerged, so they're going to have the exact same buoyant force. So it's going to be 10 as well. 
and in figure D, what's the scale rating? So now this one's a little bit different. Actually, it, it seems tricky, but it's really the easiest one. So the scale is gonna read whatever is on it. And guess what? Um, on the scale is a 12 Newton container and a 20 Newton ball. So guess what? The scale is gonna read 32 Newtons. All right, on to the last one. All right, here we have a poop balloon. Hopefully no one's offended. Um, that is being is attached to a baby carriage. Probably not the smartest thing to do. And it's filled with helium. They give us some information about the mass of the helium and the balloon together. Um, they give us the density of the air that is um, outside the balloon. This is the air of the uh, atmosphere. And they give us something about the size of the balloon. So I'm gonna check my units again. They look good, kilograms is good, kilograms cubic meter, good, meters, good. That all seems reasonable to me. Now I am gonna look at one thing really quick. I see a diameter. Now whenever I see a diameter, I make a little note to myself because a lot of times I use radiuses in equations and that sometimes they try to be sneaky and give you a diameter and you have to cut it in half. So I'm gonna just pre-cut this in half. So. So you half of three and a half is 1.75 meters. So I know the radius is 1.75 in case I need it. Because I make that mistake a lot where I put the diameter in when it's supposed to be a radius because I just see the number and I go through it too quickly. Um, let's start by drawing a free body diagram. So here's my poop balloon. We have a buoyant force acting on it. We have the uh, gravity force, the weight of the balloon. And we also have this cable helping to hold it down, a tension in the cable. All right, so determine the tension in the cable. I'll start with Newton's law equation. Just remember, buoyant force problems are really just Newton's law problems with an extra force added to it. And in our first case, it's just, it's not moving. It's this thing is not going up or down, it's just sitting there. So equilibrium, so they balance out to be zero. I can solve for the tension. That's gonna be the buoyant force minus the gravity force. And now I have to expand those. So let's um, just write over here on the side. The buoyant force is gonna be the density. Now, even though this is an air, it still works. Air is a fluid. So I can say it's gonna be the um, density of the air. Now, like how much is submerged? Well, it's surrounded by air. So the whole thing is submerged. So it's the volume of the whole object times G. So that's gonna be 1.2. Now I gotta see, okay, what's the volume of this? So I'm gonna do this separately too. So the volume of this thing is going to be See, I'm gonna assume it's a sphere, not really a sphere, but for this case, it's fine. So it's gonna be four thirds pi times the radius cubed. There's that radius I knew I was gonna to have to use. So that's four thirds times pi times 1.75 cubed. So this thing is going to have a volume of about 22.4 cubic meters. So this is 22.4 and let's use 10 for gravity. So that gives me a buoyant force of 269 newtons. Uh, now we got to find the mass of this thing, or the weight of the thing rather. That's uh, just going to be m times g. We know the mass. They gave us that so I can use the regular mass version. So that's going to be 9.5 times 10, which is 95. Plug that into there, and I get the tension in this thing is going back to red. Tension, nope. Tension is going to be uh, 174 Newtons. That's how hard you have to pull down to keep this thing from flying away. All right, part C, what's the minimum weight the baby and carriage could be to not float away? Explain, well, the baby and carriage are gonna be a thing applying this force. They have to be at least as heavy as that. So the minimum weight is gonna be equal to the tension, which is gonna be 174 Newtons. Because if you look at the baby in the carriage, you drew, drew a free body diagram. You got tension going up, you got their weight going down. And if their weight is less than the tension, guess what? They accelerate up. If their weight is at least as much as that, then they can apply enough force to hold them down. So there we go with that. Part D, the baby jumps out of the carriage, which by itself has a mass of four kilograms. What would its acceleration be once the baby gets out? So again, if we now go back, let's, we're going to do a, a kind of, not really a trick, but we're going to do something. Um, we're going to make 
the tension internal. And what that means is that we're really going to make our object, that's an O, is going to become the balloon plus the string plus the carriage. We're going to make it all one big object so we don't have to worry about the tension in between them, which means that our mass is going to be the mass of the balloon plus the mass of the carriage. So if we do that and we draw a free body diagram, we're going to have the same buoyant force. That hasn't changed at all. And now we have this new weight, the total weight of the things going down. And you can keep them separate. You can put them together. It doesn't really matter if you draw them like that or if you draw them as two separate things. Um, so let's see. Some of the forces is going to be buoyant force minus the total weight. And that's going to equal the total mass times the acceleration. So now let's, we can expand these. Uh, let's see our buoyant force. Do we know that? Yeah, we already know that. That's going to be 269. That's a number. Um, this is going to be, actually, you know what? It's probably better if I separate them because I already have one of the weights. So let me just say this is the weight of the balloon minus the weight of the carriage equals the mass of the balloon plus the mass of the carriage times A. So I'm just going to write these. Because I already had one of them, I'm going to keep them separate. And let's see. I need to know. Let's find the weight of the. Let's use a different color for that. The weight of the carriage is going to be four kilograms times ten, which equals forty newtons. And remember, this is the total mass. So let's see. We're going to get two sixty nine minus the weight of the um, balloon, my brain stopped for a second, minus the weight of the carriage, and that equals the mass of the balloon, that was 9.5, plus the mass of the carriage times A. Do a little bit of typing on your calculator and you get that the acceleration is about 9.9 .9 meters per second per second. And Last couple parts, just a couple of questions. Um, how would the original situation change if we were to use helium or neon instead? Well, let's see, what's neon gonna do? Well, the density of neon is greater than the density of helium. So that means that the, the mass of the balloon, if we assume the balloon is the same size, is going to increase. If the mass of the balloon increases, and we look back at our equations, since we're subtracting the weight of the balloon, if the mass of the balloon increases, everything that we're subtracting is going to get bigger. So if the mass of the balloon is bigger, the tension in the cable would go down and the acceleration would also go down. They both would be less because you'd be subtracting a bigger number from uh, the two situations we used to solve those. And part F, how would the original situation change if hydrogen were used? Well, that's the opposite. of part E. So in this case, the density of hydrogen is less than the density of helium. So that means the mass of the balloon, if we assume it's the same volume, is going to decrease. Well, if the mass of the balloon decreases, so does the weight, you're subtracting a smaller number. Therefore, the tension in the cable would actually go up. Because remember, in all these cases, if I mess with the density of the, the gas inside the balloon, as long as it stays the same volume, all the buoyant forces are staying the same. So in both these cases, the buoyant force does not change. So the uh, tension would go up and the acceleration would also go up. Now, I know this was a little bit of a long one, but I want to work through all these problems because they were the first ones. Um, so hopefully if you were stuck on these, that helped you out. And if you still have questions, you can always bother me.